evening, and thank you for letting me join you on this anniversary day. What I thought it might be interesting to do is take an oblique look at the execution of Anne Boleyn, to see it through the eyes of someone who was there, or who might have been there. Three years ago I published a novel called The First Horseman. It was the first in a series of Tudor crime stories featuring the exploits of a London goldsmith by the name of Thomas Treviot. Now as it happens, the very beginning of this book, the prologue, involves Thomas being a witness, an unwilling witness, of a gruesome event that took place in the Tower of London on the 19th of May 1536. I'll read that prologue in a few minutes, but before that I'd like to do a little scene setting. Much of the story takes place in Tudor London. In fact, you might almost say that London is one of the characters in the story. Here it is, as depicted in this incredible drawing by Wenceslaus Holler. He was working in the mid-17th century, but his London had changed very little from the city Anne Boleyn and her friends would have known a hundred years earlier. A square mile on the north bank of the Thames, between the Tower of London in the east and St Paul's Cathedral in the west, crammed cheek by jowl with largely timber-framed houses and having a church on almost every street. Its overcrowded streets and narrow verminous alleys were noisy and smelly. But they were also graced with the prestigious houses of wealthy merchants, of whom young Thomas Treviot was one. Across the river, over the bridge with its rows of shops and houses, lay Southwark, the capital's disreputable red light district. You will hear the term the stews mentioned in the text. The stews were the brothels where Treviot was among the customers of the ladies of the street. This is a map of Tudor London and it may help us to envisage the events of the story. Treviot lived in one of the fine merchants' houses at the St Paul's end of West Cheap. As he travels to the tower, in this extract, we can imagine his journey along Cheap, into Lombard Street, then down the hill of Gracechurch Street, which led to the river, then turning into Tower Street, towards the fortress looming over the houses. This is the tower as it was in 1536. The building in red is the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula, and the cross marks the probable site of the scaffold. But enough of this geography lesson. Let's get on with the story. Friday, the 19th of May, 1536. Someone was shaking me. Master Thomas, Master Thomas, rouse yourself. Master Thomas had not the slightest intention of rousing himself. Sod off, Will, I thrust my throbbing head deeper into the pillow. I only half heard another voice. Stand aside, Will. Give me that bowl. The wave of icy water that crashed over my head brought me gasping and coughing into the garish daylight. The shutters had been thrown open, and Robert Packington's thin, grave, disapproving countenance seemed etched on parchment. He bent over me. Cheese you, but you stink. Have you brought the stews home with you? Well, at least you were too drunk to undress. That'll save us time. Leave me alone. I rolled over to face the undrawn curtains on the far side of the bed. 
Robert grabbed me by the collar and yanked me into a sitting position. You've an appointment at the tower, and I'm going to make sure you keep it. Though the Lord knows why I bother. I struggled, but there was little strength in my arms and legs. Aided by my servant, Rob had little difficulty getting me on my feet. As I swayed, half conscious, he tackled my unfastened doublet, doing up the points. Will, fetch his best livery gown, he ordered. We have to cover up these disgusting stains. Why all the fuss? My tongue seemed swollen to twice its size in my dry mouth. You know why. We've been nominated to be among those representing the city companies. Fortunately, it's been postponed to a later hour. And that's more luck than you deserve, so don't press it any further. Slowly, grindingly, my memory's clockwork whirred into action as the two of them wrapped my blue goldsmith's gown around me. I recalled what it was. I scrabbled for an excuse. Well, the king won't... The king certainly won't be there, if that's what you were going to say. But his eyes and his ears will be. Your absence will be noted. And there will be many who'd happily put their own interpretation on it in order to make trouble for you with your superiors. You're already in bad odour in the goldsmith's company because of your recent behaviour. Any suggestion that Thomas Treviot was sympathetic to her? That's absurd, I protested. We live in times when many absurd things happen, Robert muttered bitterly. He stepped back as Will fastened the clasp on my gown and set a cap on my head. Jeez, you, what a sight. It's a mercy your father isn't here to see you. Come on. He half steered, half propelled me through the doorway and down the broad stairs to the shop, and then out into Goldsmith's Row. Our horses were waiting, and with a shove from Will I scrambled aboard Dickon, my grey gelding. West Cheap was alive with its usual hubbub, the stalls already set out, and people and horses moving along the paved thoroughfare. Despite the crowds, Robert insisted on leading the way at a bustling trot that jarred all my bones and rattled my still aching head. We must have completed the journey in fast time, although it seemed to me as long as purgatory. I was certainly unwilling to arrive at our destination. Anyone hungover, melancholy, or otherwise out of sorts, should keep away from the Tower of London. I suppose my nurse must have planted the seed of fear in me. The threat, I'll take you to the Tower, was her standard way of dealing with naughtiness, and it was usually effective. It was all too easy to believe that anything could and did happen within the walls of this monstrous soaring pile that crouched like a malevolent stone beast keeping watch over the capital. My stomach churned as we emerged from Tower Street and jogged along the well-worn track across the hill. We joined a file of other travellers on foot and horseback most of whom attached themselves to a small crowd that surrounded the bulwark gate. I looked about as we pressed our way through. My bleary gaze passed over the mixed throng, a quiet, expectant blob of humanity. A hag thrust a grubby handkerchief at me. Fetch me some of the blood, master, she screeched. We paused at the gate to have our credentials checked and were waved on to cross the causeway. We were stopped again by guards at the middle tower and the byward gate, and I swear that if my hands had not been trembling on the reins, I'd have turned Dickens' head and fled from the ordeal. Never before had I come thus far within the concentric cordons of the fortress. Occasionally business took me to the Royal Mint, but that was situated within the outer wall. 
As we dismounted, I inadvertently cringed away from the uprearing stonework. It seemed to sway as if about to crumble on top of us. Robert grasped my arm and urged me briskly forward. We entered the inner ward through yet another gateway, and followed a path beside the white tower, its recently refreshed lime wash glaring ominously. And so to the green, the theatre where the tragedy was to be performed. An arena had been created in front of St Peter's Chapel, tiered staging arranged on three sides of the black draped platform. The seats were already almost full. Prime positions were occupied by courtiers and government men. The upper levels were for prominent citizens like ourselves. We clambered up and found two spaces at one end of the topmost bench. An elderly alderman grunted and grumbled as he made room for us. Clamped between him and Robert, my stomach still churning, I wanted it all to be over, wanted to be back in the warm anonymity of my own bed. Have you ever seen the new man, Cromwell? Robert asked, pointing to a thick-set councillor seated next to the familiar figure of Lord Chancellor Audley. No. Well, take a good look and remember what you see. Cromwell is the future. He has more brains than all the rest of the King's Council put together. He's climbing fast to the top. You do well to cultivate him. I was scarcely listening. How long is it going to be? Much longer and I'll throw up. But the waiting was over. The buzz of conversation stopped, and all eyes turned towards a gateway beside the White Tower. It was a small procession, two pikemen, four female attendants, then the constable, Sir William Kingston, and beside him a woman, small but walking very erect, in an ermine mantle over a grey gown, her face framed by a gable hood. Queen Anne of England, going to her death. She was helped onto the platform and spent some minutes talking with her ladies, two of whom seemed on the point of collapse with grief. One was on her knees clutching the Queen's gown and had to be pulled away by a guard. Anne turned and came to the edge of the dais. Not a flicker of movement from her audience as she lifted her head to speak. I leaned forward, focused on the slight figure. My head seemed suddenly clear. No priest, Tom, Robert muttered in my ear. No priest. Mark that. It was a brief speech, and I don't recall all the details. I know what she did not say. The silence all London was a buzz with for days after. She did not confess her adulteries. She bade us pray for the king and for herself. And then the women helped her remove her cape and her headdress. Her long hair gleamed in the sunlight before she tucked it into a little cap. As she was composing herself, a tall figure stepped onto the stage behind her. I turned to Robert. Who? Oh, the executioner, brought especially from France. They say he's very good. Pray God it may be so. One of the ladies came forward with a blindfold, but before it was fastened, the Queen looked around the ranks of men, happy or content or indifferent, to witness her destruction. As her gaze reached the end of the line, it rested on me for a long moment, or, or so it seemed. I could not tear my eyes away from the slight figure, who now knelt, her head bent forward, her lips moving in silent prayer. Up to that moment, the performance had proceeded at a slow, almost stately pace, like a sinister pavane. But now, 
and the executioner took a stride forward, swinging his large sword as he did so. It flashed down in a wide arc. The cat's head fell to the floor, bounced and rolled a few feet. The body, fountaining blood, remained upright for several seconds before tumbling sideways. And that was when I threw up all over the smart black gown of the man sitting in front of me. I suppose most of us would have felt nauseous too, even if we weren't experiencing a hangover. Anne suffered a monstrous injustice at the hands of a monstrous king. But when I find myself thinking like that, the historian in me kicks in and says, hang on a minute, you mustn't look at this through 21st century eyes. Attitudes to death and suffering were very different 500 years ago. For a start, everyone lived much closer to death. The King's painter, Hans Holbein, produced a fine set of engravings, usually referred to as the Dance of Death, making the point that death is a universal leveller. Kings, monks, bishops, ploughmen and queens all have to keep that final appointment. when average life expectancy was around 35 years, it wasn't just pious people who thought long and hard about preparing to meet their maker and their judge. The next world was more important than this one. To witness an execution was to reflect on one's own eternal destiny. Anne Boleyn had a firm faith and knew that she was going to a better place. She also realised, what every English man and woman knew, that her life was at the disposal of the king. And that's not to say that the subject had no protection from injustice. But if the law upheld the king's demand that a man or woman should die, then that had to be accepted. For the king was God's deputy and answerable only to God. Anyway, back to the story, or rather the two stories, the real and the imaginary. Thomas Treviot made his way, thankfully, back to the comfort and security of West Cheap. His adventures were just beginning. Anne had only one short journey to make, across the green to the chapel of St Peter Ad Vincula. According to legend, no one had thought to provide a coffin, and her body was packed into an arrow crate. She was laid to rest before the altar, where her body lay undisturbed until 1876. When restoration work was in progress, the paving of the chancel was removed, 
and the graves beneath were examined. Part of the report on Anne's grave reads as follows. The bones of the head indicate a well-formed round skull with an intellectual forehead. I wonder what an intellectual forehead looks like. I wonder if I have one. Anyway, an intellectual forehead. Straight orbital ridge, large eyes, oval face, and rather square, full chin. The remains of the vertebrae and the bones of the lower limbs indicate a well-formed woman of middle height, with a short and slender neck. The ribs show depth and roundness of chest. The hand and feet bones indicate delicate and well-shaped hands and feet, with tapering fingers and a narrow foot. Strange to think, isn't it, that 140 years ago, someone was actually able to touch Anne Boleyn. We can only approach her and her contemporaries through written records. Records that spur our imagination. Imagination. The historian's vital tool. But it's no good just assembling facts. Vital though they are, they can only be the starting points. The actual available details of Anne's execution are fairly sparse. A few shapes and blobs of colour on an otherwise blank canvas. We historians have to fill in the background in order to give our readers a feel for what it may have been like. That's our job, to bring the past to life. As historical novelists, of course, we also deal in imagination. But if the historian needs imagination to bring facts to life, the fictioneer needs intellectual discipline to create a convincing framework of fact for his stories. We are not allowed to play fast and loose with history. Our tales have to be credible. Anyone reading The First Horseman knows these things didn't happen. But I hope that he or she will believe that they could have happened. Why did I choose to start my series of Cheviot adventures with this famous, or infamous, event? Well, one reason was to persuade readers to look at it from a different angle. To notice things they might not otherwise have seen. To get a feel of the event. And of course also to make them curious about my central character. I must be honest. Why is this wealthy young merchant throwing his life away on wine and women? Who is the sombre Packington who seems determined to save Treviot from himself? Only if I have established the bond that existed between these two men can I expect the reader to care when Packington gets murdered. I went, by the way, Packington is a real historical character. Hopefully, if the first Treviot story has hooked readers, they will want to read the second. And if that pleases them, they may want to read number three, The Devil's Chalice, which I'm delighted to say Made Global is publishing in a few weeks' time. And uh, on that plug, I think we could end. Good night.